already seen how there is been a development of the various kinds of techniques through which texts are created. And uh, when before writing had come into being, oral forms of communication of ideas and stories, oral storytelling had to depend on human memory, right. So, it did not have written formats in which, uh, which could substitute for the human memory in any way. So, therefore, there were certain formulary structures of poetry, which made that, uh, made that process of remembering things through the mind uh, easier. And what we see one of the characteristics of oral culture is that, uh, that the various features of oral, oral uh, storytelling, oral uh, you know narratives you know, primarily were due to a certain economy that was in, uh, enforced due to oral methods of composition of stories you know you, and, and the reason I am using the word stories is because I do not want to use the, use the word poetry because poetry is, is the most important feature because poetry has a certain uh, formula to it. it, it has a certain scheme to it whether in terms of rhyme or rhythm. Uh, you know, uh, so therefore, that itself. So these are these are some of the rhyme and rhythm is associated with poetry. But what we need to understand is that the reason rhyme and rhythm is associated with poetry because it is a oral. It, it it emanated as oral form. Rhyme and rhythm is not so much associated with prose because prose is more associated with writ written forms of uh, storytelling, right? So that is that is a very crucial thing point that we need to understand certain things that we take for granted were not so much uh, uh, you know uh, natural or uh, you know uh, given it, these were creations due to the certain conditions in which storytelling were happening the technologies which were available or not available <coughs> so we have a oral form of storytelling which which required the human mind to remember uh, the progression of the story and, and that was made easier through certain mnemonic uh, features in which, uh, which uh, were, were conducted through uh, things like rhyme and rhythm and their various poetic features. There were also each poet and when I say poet, we, we conjure in our mind naturally the idea of someone sitting down and writing poetry on a piece of paper, you know, perhaps with a uh, with, with a very very beautiful uh, kind of a plumed um, uh, you know uh, pen and that that is not uh, that is not actually true i mean the uh, oral poetry a troubadour or the bard would move around from place to place and tell stories uh, and the stories were not written down anywhere because writing hadn't developed they would have stories which they 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 knew and and it would actually be wrong to say that they were uh, stories that they knew because they would know some bare bones of the story, right? And they would make up the exact composition of the story then and there, all right, at the point of time. Suppose while telling a story, someone asks a question or someone gives a certain response, and the poet responds by uh, telling another story, you know answers that question by telling another story. I had earlier referred to the story, uh, the, the Panchatantra for example. In the Panchatantra you see there are stories within stories and the, st the stories sort of branch out. You know, it is a very branch like uh, structure of a story, uh, which moves from one narrative to another to another, then returns back half the way, goes back to another narrative. And therefore, the Panchatantra is not only five stories, there are many stories in it. And so, in this process of storytelling, what happens with um, the, uh, the oral poet, the bard, is that they have some bare bones of the story in mind, which then the reiteration of it, the iteration, exact iteration of that particular story is at, at that moment. Therefore, oral storytelling is a performative form, a performance is 
by very nature ephemeral. Ephemeral means it finishes off in the moment, it lives in the moment and finishes off in the moment, there is no record for it. Like uh, if I were to, if this were a physical class and there were students sitting here and there was no camera there, then this would have been an ephemeral event, this lecture itself would have been a completely ephemeral event. Uh, it would exist in the students' minds and in my mind, whatever in recall, maybe some people would be taking notes, but the exact event cannot be reproduced. However, with the camera, this is getting recorded, but let me assure you that the camera is not recording everything. Camera is focused towards only a particular frame around me and probably the screen at some sort, uh, sometimes when, when it is cutting into it, but it is not recording the, the little uh, uh, props th which are lying at that corner of the room, which are outside the field of the camera, whereas anybody who is seated here would have a full view of exactly what is happening, the exact context in which this performance in the form of a lecture is actually happening, right. So let us not mistake and say that, you know, today uh, uh, it is possible to actually record and uh, performance is no longer ephemeral because no matter where anybody, any performance is happening, someone or the other is holding out a camera and taking a, uh, uh, taking a video of it. Yes, the ephemeral quotient has certainly gone down. There are certain parts of the of the of the uh, of the performance which can which which is getting fixed in uh, in uh, in hard drives in uh, certain uh, you know physical memory, but performance itself you must understand is an uh, is a perf uh, is a, is an ephemeral form and therefore oral storytelling is an ephemeral form and therefore to return to my point the that the when the poet or the bard, the oral storyteller is telling a story, the exact iteration, the exact story that is told is told in the moment. It is not something that the person has learnt by heart and therefore telling you, but the person actually has a notion of these are the points that I want to touch upon and at that moment they bring up examples, they bring up ideas they, and as you see on the screen it says bring up epithets. Epithets is something that would give an example. If you want to tell, uh, 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 give a you know example of let's say certain emotion like jealousy or anger, then you give a certain example of what anger could be, and therefore you tell a little story. Those collection of epithets is something that the poet knows. This one-to-one -one correspondence between the, uh, between a particular epithet and a particular context is, may, may, uh, is possibly made in the moment. Certain poets would have certain favorite epithets. Certain poets would learn to pick and choose specific epithets in specific situations which are more appropriate, which uh, convey the idea better, which the audience likes. And a good poet would also be somebody who would have a larger repertoire of epithets, who is not repetitive. Imagine if they were, everybody compared the sun to a red rose or something, you know, or, or a flower or, or the yolk of an egg. If, if uh, the poet was constantly, every time there is a reference to sun, he says like a yolk of an egg. Every time the, there is a uh, reference to the sun, he says yolk of the egg. Then the, then the audience would be in tremendously bored, the, the audience would not like it. So therefore, the poet has to refer to the sun in, in various forms and that is the repertoire of epithets. But there is no one to one correspondence at a, various points of time, it is like an array, it is like, it's like a buffet of epithets that are there in the poet's mind and the poet just goes, okay, I have to talk about the sun now. I have to talk about the river now, I have to talk about the snow now. So I go and pick up whatever epithet that comes to my mind which I can better apply. And that was what differentiated good poets from bad poets as to what kind of epithets uh, they use. And that is in fact true even today in, in this state of written poetry. Only thing is in the written poetry, once it is written down, it gets finalized, it gets fixed. That is what a certain poet has written, that is it. It will not change, right? Once it is printed and passed on and it is it, 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 it sealed, right? But whereas in, in, in the case of uh, uh, oral poetry rendition, oral storytelling, the epithets would be something that would uh, keep on altering or changing. 
all right. Now, the second point uh, is, the, uh, is that epithets will also have to be for various meters. So, there are various, so if you understand metrical patterns of uh, poetry, you realize that the way we talk has a certain rhythm to it. So, there is a tune which goes up and down each, uh, and that is what makes it pleasant to, to the ear, right. Now, sometimes some meters are uh, at a fast rhythm, some meters are at a slower rhythm, some meters are at a stacco rhythm, some meters at a more uh, sort of harmonious uh, uh, rhythm. Now, the epithets will also have to be matching the meter of that particular poem. That matching is something that is very, very important, right? Because if there is no variation in the meter of the poem, if the poet, uh, of the sto uh, storytelling, then it again is something not, not going to be uh, very interesting to the, to the, to the, to the uh, audience. So imagine if some poet uh, 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 tells poetry or story only in one rhythm, ta da ta da ta da ta da ta da ta da, then it's it's not something that is that is interesting at all. So you have to vary vary the rhythm. You know, good songs are ones which uh, move fast and then go slow, and then move fast and then go slow, and vary their rhythm at various points of time. So as the rhythm that is occurring at that moment of time in the storytelling, the epithet has to match. So all I'm trying to assert is that memory is not a verbatim memory of the entire poem. A, a full epic could be uh, something around, uh, you know, many, many hundreds and thousands of lines uh, uh, long. But uh, that is not, does that not mean that in oral form, the poet remembered each and everything. They remembered hell of a lot. They did, did remember quite a bit. They did not have any uh, written record to fall back upon, but they did not have verbatim memory. So, every rendition would vary from the previous rendition. That is exactly what I am trying to tell you. Then let us move on. The need for repetition. The point is because nothing was written down, the only way to ensure the continuity of a text was repetition. That if I heard something, I need to remember it, repeat it again and again in order to make, make sure that I do not forget about it. And this is very specific, very important to understand because the way in which the uh, memory in the, in the brain actually operates, the neurons actually operate. And this is something that we are going to pick on later in the course when we try to understand the changes that are being brought about due to digital media. But for now, let us understand that every time we encounter a certain, uh, a new uh, idea, all right, it produces certain changes in the chemical patterns of the neuron, the, the, the physical patterns which are there, phys uh, physical and chemical changes that take place within the neurons within the brain, right. The neurons, they, uh, the synapses, they uh, sort of uh, ally with each other in very different sort of way uh, each time and that is how the, the brain actually remembers. Now, what happens is once you have heard something and you hear it again, that synapse sort of gets solidified a little bit more and then that synapse gets solidified a little bit more the next time there is a revision. So, then that is why when one is learning something, when one is practicing something, those are the things that are getting formed. Now, if we are not repeating something, then uh, if, if there is for a very long period of time, if we have not heard about something, we tend to forget it, right. This is because once the synapse is not being used, it gets used for other things, all right. Uh, and, and that synapse is sort of lost, okay. But when we again remember it, the, there is a sort of etching mark which is there on the synapse. It goes and falls back on it, right. So, this is the process through which uh, memory operates, human memory actually operates is very much a physical memory as well is something that we need to understand. So, therefore, knowledge once acquired within the oral domain had to be kept 
alive by constant repetition. There is also another aspect to this, because we understand without the, uh, without the presence of written text or written documents, with, uh, uh, script, scripted documents, uh, knowledge could pass from one generation to another only through repetition. It is only by through this memory process of memory that texts could pass forward. So, therefore, you have in traditional societies rituals where these oral texts uh, have a very important meaning, they, they have to be repeated each time. And for, for, for uh, conventional understanding, it is given the state of some, uh, status of something sacred that the repetition creates some important uh, sort of uh, 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 changes, it brings, it has some magical powers. Uh, which is something that we, we need not be concerned about right now, but what is important is that th the very act of repetition of these texts keep these texts into being. But another point that we need to also know that this act of repetition is not like a photocopy, it is not like a mechanical copy where the same impression is brought about in the next. Through generations, through each repetition, through each circulation, the text undergoes certain mutations, undergoes certain changes, there are interpolations that are brought in. We just saw in the previous point that even for the same oral storyteller, this every new rendering of a story is unique. So, therefore, it is too much to expect that across uh, generations or across uh, geography, when a story gets repeated and uh, recounted, it would continue to be the same. So, across space and time, stories keep changing. That is why, when you look at mythologies or mythological stories or legends, you find there is there might be a commonality between stories in various uh, states of India or uh, various countries of the world. But there are certain nuances, certain changes which are which are there. The basic tenet may be the same, but there are certain changes to that story, because they are in the process of storytelling, they are getting adapted to certain space and certain times. So, they, are, they, are, they move through these time and spaces and, and the story gets adapted. So, the repetition is not an, never an exact, a fixed repetition, but rather it goes on uh, in the form of uh, uh, an alteration, a mutation and therefore, newer stories are formed, the uh, narratives become newer. This is something that is very, very important to understand. Then oral forms are always, you must, we should not forget that these are in a, uh, these are in uh, uh, circulated within a personal interactive world. This is uh, that when I am telling a story or I am giving a lecture with a room full of students, it is a very personal experience. I am interacting with each student physically. We are all exist in the physical space, whereas the mechanical reproduction that is taking place through the, or in this particular case may be a digital reproduction through the camera, it is very, very impersonal. It is not personal. It is uh, impersonal. There is, there is some hope of some interactivity which may be there uh, across the forum and I uh, strongly recommend that you bring up what all your doubts and ideas and disagreements through the forum which I would be very happy to answer. However, it is there, there is no taking away from it that the physical interaction between teacher and student is absolutely ab 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 absent in this digitally reproduced world which is there in the performative world, in the oral storytelling. Okay. So, moving on as I said earlier, the speech is ephemeral, speech is performative, speech is ephemeral and it is tied to the speaker. This is very, very crucial as I said earlier that there without the presence of the speaker, that storytelling is does not come about. You, someone else may be teaching this chapter, someone else may be teaching this essay but will not be teaching this essay in the same way. As the same song could be sung by many singers, but each singer has their own voice and their own 
uh, bringing, brings in their own innovations to the singing of the song, to the rendering of the song. And so, that is something undeniable. So, speech is somewhere tied directly with the, with the, uh, with the, with the presence of the speaker. All right? This is something that we need to talk about as to whether, how is writing different from speech. Because you understand when, when an author writes a book, you, the name of the author is there. So, therefore, the author is also tied to the scripted book. But the way the author is tied to, this, to the book, uh, to, the, to the narrative of the book is very different to the way the speaker is tied to the speech that is given. Uh, and that is something that uh, we will, we will uh, figure out in some time as we go along. We will touch upon that theme as well. Spoken words cannot be erased. Once said, it is there in your mind. It, they, may, they may get obliterated and nobody remembers it anymore. Or very, there might be a very faint memory in the mind of people, but they cannot be erased in the way a written word can be erased. A written word can be, the page can be torn up or uh, you can actually, uh, if it is written with some other medium, you can erase it. Uh, you can also uh, scratch it out, you can rewrite it, you can do various kinds of things, but uh, spoken words cannot be erased. It can only be supplemented or denied. Someone says, I have been misquoted, I have been misunderstood, because the words that were said are there. They cannot be taken back. You cannot go around and say that, okay, okay. I am going to uh, remove the post that I have put yesterday on Twitter. That is not something that is possible in the case of spoken words. They can only be supplemented. I can add, I can add a clarification, I can say something, but I cannot remove it in any sort of way. Speech is natural only to the extent uh, you must understand speech is natural given that it is not using any, uh, any physical tool. However, language is not natural. Language is something that is uh, created by human beings for communication. Language, uh, I mean there are some basic form of signaling that various animals actually use and communicate with each other. We know that dolphins can com or whales can communicate across great distance almost uh, through the ocean, almost 500 miles they can communicate with each other. Uh, so, um, we would say that uh, you know, uh, even there, the the exact signaling is something that has developed. People, uh, I think, I think uh, organisms do learn the, the the various kinds of symbolisms or say, signaling uh, processes. But human language is a far far more evolved uh, uh, sort of um, you know phenomena, which 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 we do not see the uh, see the. Um, you know the replication of it, see the evidence of it in the animal world. And I had told you something about the use of the mouth uh, for consumption of food and the use of the mouth for uh, 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 picking up food. Uh, human beings do not pick up food with the mouth, which is why the mouth is organized very differently, which makes uh, complex use of language very much possible. So, language is, uh, is, is more uh, something that is in, uh, innovative, more uh, artificial, but speech, the process of making sound is natural only to the extent that we do not use any external tool like a pen or a keyboard or something of that sort. All right? Now, in orality, we cannot have charts or lists. Orality could narrate, but not juxtapose. You cannot bring associations with each other. The word and when I am speaking, this is very important. When we said that the presence of the speaker cannot be denied, you know, the, it is tied to the speaker, we also mean that the way I say something, the particular tonality, particular way of speaking is something that gets tied to that, the, the speaker. And that is not something that is possible in the written. Uh, in the written, the, that tonality could be lost. Orality is practiced in the presence of others and you know the oral code is something that cannot uh, deal with the unfamiliar. It relegates meaning largely to the context. Usually when you, we sp when you speak, 
we are we have in our mind we live in a literate universe for us we are we are interacting with the world of books as well as the world of uh, world of um, you know when, uh, lectures but in a situation where there was there was no uh, there were no books or written material that was available when writing hadn't yet emerged the only way people could communicate was to create the context within the world of the speech you could not cross refer with other books or other things all right so uh, that is something that 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 uh, writing actually develops better uh, we, we it it was not something that was developed in the form uh, in the oral form oral form you could not create charts or lists you know and provide a graph there is no way to do that all right so therefore the only way that oral um, uh, uh, tellers would have to impress upon uh, their listeners was one of the things that they use was rhetoric rhetoric was less analytical it was it impressed it it, it impressed people through the use of flower, uh, of interesting language through the tone tonality and the argument all right there was there was uh, the so rhetoric did not bring it 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 did not rely on analytical or uh, you know uh, factual uh, uh, resources it is like getting impressed by somebody's way of speaking and not bothering whether the person is saying the truth or the, or the falsity right it is a, it's how convincing you are it's very very difficult to imagine that in our today's universe because the moment somebody has spoken there can be 10000 fact checks that could be done but that is not for something that was accessible in an oral universe people could not fact check they would say yes he sounded convincing and therefore i accept it all right so rhetoric had uh, various kinds of uh, elements in it that is uh, invention that is you create newer epithets newer ideas arrangement how to organize that those ideas style what kind of language you use uh, and delivery how you how you present how what kind of tone how how well you, you talk how wh what kind of physical presence you have and the f the fifth point that is memory is how well you remember that is a very very important element but memory gets reduced in the world of writing when you, when we come to writing there are the three r's of writing the reading writing and arithmetic arithmetic calculation is something that is brought about through writing not through the oral process all right now if we move on uh, to the, what happens in written cultures uh, in the written cultures uh, when the early written cultures start coming into being you had uh, uh, um, uh, various poets relying on phrase books to try to uh, create an additional sort of memory make it easier to remember the various epithets that they have to bring in to their storytelling now initially it, it was uh, looked upon as a, a kind of a negative practice that yeah i mean the ideal poet would be able to remember everything we we have heard how plato uh, underplayed the importance of memory or, or, or frowned at uh, importance of uh, 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 I mean he frowned upon the substitution of memory through writing because you know Plato felt that memory is a very important thing you you need to constitute all the ideas within your own self within the body so that it, it is it is uttered a, a, in a sort of authentic way all right however externalization of knowledge in the form of a written text is looked upon is frowned down upon it it seems somewhere impersonal and therefore reduced it's shown uh, to be to to access knowledge from an impersonal source is looked upon as something that is inferior therefore the ideal poet is someone who does not refer to phrase books it is only for beginners to use phrase books this is what how how uh, the culture of writing actually develops at that point of time all right uh, and uh, we were going to constantly see that as writing technologies technologies of textual communication changes the 
ideas of the previous uh, set, uh, set of technologies seeps into the new and, and lives with the new for a long period of time till such time the new stands on its own and in time gives way to a future uh, 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 technology altogether. All right? And so, that is something that we need to understand that uh, every time there is a change, it will bring something of the old and carry it on to something of the new. In the, uh, in the text, um, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the written text, one very important change is that the author cannot be reached. The author is, one cannot reach the author, you cannot refute, whereas, whereas in the, in a, in a oral disputation, when the, the speaker is always there, someone can ask a question, someone can dispute a point, but in the written text, the written text has a life of its own, it can travel without the author. So, when someone is reading it and a question arises or a dispute arises, there is no way that the author can be reached to uh, answer those questions. So, and very importantly, imagine a situation where there is a debate happening and there are two speakers who are speaking and they say opposite points and there is a disputation and there is a final finally you come to a certain conclusion, there is a resolution. Then that resolution is what everybody really takes home, that you take both the points together. However, in a written text, if there is a dispute, then after the dispute, you do not have that the original text has been removed, it has been erased, it is still there. right? So, it continues to say something, it is not necessary that some reader, uh, all readers will read both the uh, text A and text B together. So, the disputation and the proposition need not be uh, uh, looked at together. So, even after, so therefore, even after refutation, the proposition has a life of its own, all right. So, this is the reason why there is a tradition, there would be, would have been a tradition, why books would be burnt. The book says, it is, I mean, you, there is no way to undo the book. So, therefore, the book is burnt, all right. And there, and the opposite is also true. What happens is that people uh, get a sense that if a book says something, it must be true, you know. If a book says something, it must be true, right. Because it is linked to this idea people are still not able to understand, how can a book speak? Because what you get used to is a person speaking, person speaking from their own uh, uh, knowledge and experience. Knowledge is something that is supposed to be internalized. Uh, a book of knowledge is not something that could be fathomed, because the book is not a living, walking, talking, living being. It is only living beings who have experience and knowledge. The book itself does not have any experience. Book is an externalized uh, storage of experience, but the book itself is not experience. So, therefore, you are the book is though it contains knowledge, it does not actually ex contain the knowledge through the process of going through an experience and reaching that conclusion, all right. All right. So, there is a confusion here, there is a confusion here that you know books can stand on their own, all right, because people think that if the, if the book can say something that is uh, something true, uh, if the book can uh, say, uh, say something that is true, that, uh, that has knowledge, then maybe the book has some magical quality, all right. So, therefore, there is this, uh, this, this doubt, existential doubt as to what, what, what a book really is, all right. Then we move on to the idea that, uh, you know, written words can actually be erased and this is tied to the previous point that, you know, books are burnt, written words can be removed uh, is something that you need to understand. This is before the coming of print, by the way. Print is, is more difficult to erase, but written words can be erased, you know. Even when certain ideas can be etched onto stones, 
stones can be uh, I mean they would they would actually chip off uh, an entire piece in case someone had to rewrite it and inscribe it or change the stone altogether. So, written word can be erased whereas, spoken words cannot be erased, but at the same point of time till such time that the text is erased there is no way that the disputation of that text is complete. The disputation of text produces another text and you have to look at both the text together. So, I think I hope you are understanding this uh, complication that the coming of the text coming of writing at the same point of time makes erasure possible as well as makes the presence more, more secure till such time that a certain text written word is erased it, it, it stays as it is. There is no way, so, uh, so even before the coming of print a certain manuscript could be uh, a certain text could have many manuscripts could be could have uh, uh, several uh, uh, and not in the number of not in hundreds, but certainly in scores or dozens um, they could be there. So, if you get rid of one text it, it one um, manuscript does not mean that the other manuscripts are also gone or you can dispute one manuscript, but still the other manuscripts are being read without uh, their uh, without the presence of the refutation. And what you need to understand is sometimes these manuscripts, these manuscripts are not uh, great in number, the manuscripts would be when they when they are created they would be very rare and they would be a, a, a kept with only with uh, certain people primarily ecclesiastical authorities within churches within priest, uh, with priests with, uh, with certain uh, uh, maybe royal families right. So, and there would be great geographical distances between the uh, each manuscript people would have to travel great distances to be able to read those manuscripts or ac access those manuscripts or they would um, uh, not have access to the manuscript not everybody could uh, could read or, or write most of these manuscripts would uh, would have been written through in classical languages and uh, not everybody could uh, had literacy literacy uh, uh, is something that that was rare right we are talking about a largely non literate world so you cannot imagine a situation where the presence of the both the proposed text and the refuted text are uh, uh, are known to everybody the presence of them are known to every uh, everyone who is accessing that particular text all right this is a very very small literate world that we are talking about all right so that is another point the oral universe would have uh, would have a larger presence uh, larger ra larger reach the written universe would have reduced that reach but that is a, a different point that we are going to look at in some time. Now, we understand we talked about how uh, speech is natural and therefore, writing is artificial, but when we say artificial we do not uh, say it in a negative sense, but a positive sense that the use of technology can actually enrich human life and spirit. It enables realization of fuller and interior human potentials, why because now it is possible to actually have access with writing it becomes possible to actually have uh, access to experiences of people across time and space a particular individual a particular scholar in an oral universe would be able to gain knowledge only from people whom he or she has met but with the coming of writing knowledge can be acquired not only from great distances just the manuscript comes in then you learn about somebody else's ideas and somebody else's experience not only that you also learn of the experience of generations of people before you all right now you would say that even in oral poetry uh, 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 you know texts traveled from generation to generation they did yes they did but then plethora the amount of text that is available to a certain scholar or a listener was was very, very extremely restricted because now manuscripts have a certain mobility one they can travel across geography two 
when oral texts tra travel from one generation to another, they do so, uh, 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 when oral texts travel from one generation to another, they do so by through mutation, whereas in a written text that mutation is minimized. When a manuscript is there, it is almost, uh, it is slower in change. Till that manuscript is written down, the text remains the same. Yes, it is possible that someone else copies that and that copy has some interpolations into it, but the process is much, much slower than that of oral rendering. All right? You understand that? In the oral rendering, every rendering is unique, whereas in the uh, in the uh, written in the chirographic world, every rewriting is unique. Every time someone refers to that text and speaks uh, or uh, reads it, it remains the same. All right? This is something that we need to keep in mind. So the changes in the text, the possibility of change in the text, has been arrested, has been reduced. Not as much that it would be arrested in print, but uh, in writing, which is still a manual form of reproduction, it is it is it is uh, arrested. It is slowed down. So two points: across time and across space, more texts become available to the scholars, and uh, 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 you know intellectual uh, capacity of the human species becomes uh, 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 enhanced to a great extent. Now, and because of the various characteristics of text that I said, you know, the text actually externalizes human experience and keeps it outside that of the human body. This brings about that, that contradiction that I talked about, brings about an association between writing and power. Till now, rhetoric was powerful, but now, you know, uh, writing is linked with power that the text itself ha can have a certain experience, the text contains a certain knowledge. So, next is often regarded as some kind of secret or magic power. All right? So, there would be people who would and you, you, some of you may be aware of it, I mean you write a mantra or some sacred uh, word on a piece of paper, wrap it around and wear it as an amulet on your body to have that magic power uh, or, or chant. You also have, uh, you know, when you when you go to some of the Tibetan monasteries, you have these jap jantras, who, which where you you twist it around and it has a certain inscriptions on it, and you twist it around and it has that magic power. So text gets associated in the early geographic world with some kind of secret or magic power, and this this emanates primarily from the idea that uh, you know that what is supposed to here is here is a stone that talks or a piece of papyrus that talks or a uh, parchment that talks can 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 uh, non uh, non humans speak non uh, inanimate objects have any any speech but here you are the book speaks so the book has magic all right so that is the association which is there you know, but there were other associations also. The societies where there are limited literacies, and all early geographic societies had limited literacies. Only the most learned people, primarily the priests, would have literacy. They are the ones who would have literacy. It would not also, uh, uh, always, uh, in fact, the royal families, the, the rulers would also probably sometimes be illiterate, would be non literate, so to say. Because one of the ways in which knowledge is controlled and knowledge is linked to power. The more you know, the more you can question. So therefore, the capacity to know has to be reduced and the only way to reduce the capacity to uh, know is by reducing, uh, uh, reducing the cap uh, capacity to uh, read and therefore reduce literacy. So, so, so not everybody was allowed to re uh, learn reading or writing. All right? So this is somewhere I want to bring in uh, uh, the idea that is this some is this something that this this restriction of knowledge is something that is coming about only in the chirographic world only after uh, writing comes into being? No, certainly not. Uh, you know, um, even in the oral universe, 
you had a situation where not everybody was allowed uh, into every space where where oral rendering uh, uh, rend uh, rendering is happening right so for example certain uh, certain uh, uh, you know rituals should be conducted in sacred spaces and this sec uh, some, uh, certain people of certain castes or certain uh, uh, ethnicities would not be allowed into those sacred spaces the sacred spaces would become uh, um, uh, would uh, would get uh, um, uh, lose their purity if they would, uh, if the, uh, there was anybody from another caste or another ethnicity who enters it, and that there would be certain purification rituals which would be, which would be, um, uh, uh, you know, which which would be conducted in order to return the sacredness. So there were these practices through which certainly there would also be punishments to the people who would intrude upon that sacred space. So this the space for. Uh, for oral or various kinds of oral rendition would have been ex extremely restricted all right even today you would know that you know that when when there are uh, various uh, rituals within the family there are certain rituals which are only for women uh, and that's that sort of an oral domain where men are not allowed in, in into that space so there is a certain kind of restriction that uh, that oral oral uh, rendering oral universe can also bring about and that is primarily through re restricting access to to that space now this kind of uh, uh, restriction of access has has been historically there because knowledge is associated with power all right the more you know the more you can question and the more you can therefore challenge authority so uh, and I would argue through this course that each new form of technology would have newer forms of uh, res uh, making sure, ma uh, ma making this restriction possible. It also is that with new, each new form of technology, things get, issues get democratized even more, right. So, very importantly that, uh, that there is this, there is this tussle between a democratizing trend, progressive trend within technology, uh, within uh, communication technologies versus uh, the, uh, the need of, of the powerful to restrict the flow of knowledge. So, just to give you an idea, copyright is another very important uh, mechanism through which knowledge is restricted because print can lead to the proliferation of, of, of knowledge. Uh, copyright becomes one mechanism through which you ensure that n uh, cheap access to knowledge is n uh, uh, becomes becomes more difficult, right? Most of the times we are paying uh, more for the uh, copyright uh, uh, than we are paying for the actual printing uh, or, or, or the physical book that is there. Access is also also restricted. Uh, this particular uh, set of lectures is much more accessible because um, uh, for many users they can access the uh, access the lectures purely by generating a login there is a, there is a limitation that you cannot probably uh, access it without a login but there is no pay uh, associated with it right unless you want to take the exam as far as i understand that is the current uh, mechanism through which these courses are running, but still, so this is a far more uh, uh, democratic, more uh, more progressive uh, form of uh, uh, educational platform. However, there are many other courses, online courses, which require you to uh, pay a certain amount of money. And moment uh, you want to, pay, uh, you have to pay a certain amount of money. It restricts the access to a certain. Uh, set of people who uh, who have the capability of paying that um, the fees that you have to pay for educational institutions restricts the access to the, to that uh, institution so knowledge in various ways gets uh, uh, gets restricted uh, across uh, time and in a, in a, in the early chilographic world the limitations on literacy was one way in which knowledge was possible but you must understand the other point is also true whereas in an oral universe there was no way no way that someone uh, uh, from uh, from the restricted uh, 
uh, sections, whether it be caste or ethnicity, could actually enter a space where knowledge was being distributed. All right. We know the story of Eklavya. Eklavya overheard, Eklavya from a distance learned what Dron was teaching uh, the, uh, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, but he had to pay with his thumb because he, he was not someone who, was, uh, who, who had access to that space, but he did so uh, surreptitiously right? and he had to pay for it. And he had, uh, so, if he was not that, there in that space, he could not have gained that knowledge. He, he got access to that space, he gained that knowledge, but had to pay for it, he, had, he was punished. But with the literate universe, it is possible that somebody gets literacy and gets hold of a copy of the book and reads it. So, literacy is really the access. If the person gets caught either reading or writing or uh, gets caught uh, with, uh, in po with possession of that book, will be punished tremendously. But, uh, and, and the, if, you, if you read uh, the stories of the very early 19th century uh, uh, women learners in India, like Rashandari Devi, if you read her autobiography, Amar Jibon, My Life, there she says how she uh, stole time from housework to read and write. She would at the, uh, she would sit in the kitchen and with a piece of charcoal try to learn the alphabet. And the moment there were footsteps, sounds of a footfall, she would quickly sweep, uh, keep, the, keep, the, keep the charcoal and the, all the writing implements away, because she did not want to be seen reading or writing, otherwise life would have become very difficult for her, because they would, she would have been admonished, she would have been, there will be tremendous restrictions placed on her, but her it, in, determination in order to read or write, and this is something that women were not allowed to read and write. Right, because reading and writing is associated with with access to knowledge. Because then you can read books and gain knowledge. You cannot any longer be restricted by physical restrictions of space. Right. So these uh, societies with limited literacies regarded writing as dangerous because writing would mean the possibility of knowledge passing on, getting into the wrong hands, all right. And illiterate people, people who are uh, non-literate, they would uh, look upon the text at the same time as magical, having magical properties. They would also rub the books on their foreheads or, or lay obeisance to books or prey on books, all right. And writing is a form where you must understand that writing required, uh, it is not just going to a shop and, uh, and buying a pen and, uh, and, and writing. You know, in the early days of writing, one had to actually create the implements through which writing and ha ha had to happen. Uh, it, it, you cannot go to a shop and buy a book, uh, buy an exercise copy and a, and a pencil or a pen and start writing. You had to create your own pen, you had to go and get, get that piece of feather cut it exactly, have, have that sharp implement, know exactly how you have to prepare the ink and you have to constantly use it. And when you are writing with, 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 with a feather with a quill, you have to constantly um, make sure that the sharpness of the quill is maintained. It is very much like a pencil, you have to, you have to constantly maintain that. So, only a few people could write. And so, you had a situation where sometimes the oral poets who were good at creating uh, texts, you know, were create, uh, putting together poetry, uh, were, were not very good at writing. They could because it, it was a certain craft and they did not have the knowledge of the craft. So, you have a case where um, Ved Vyas would require the help of Ganesha to write the Mahabharat, really. Hmm? So, he, because he, he, he could not uh, write, he was probably uh, not uh, literate enough. So, he could create, but Ganesha would write for it. Ganesha was the scribe, all right. So, that is something that uh, you uh, uh, need to remember. So, as writing developed, you know, we, when writing happens, uh, you know, we lose the tone, the intonation, 
to the uh, to uh, in 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 the form of writing you know whether i am the way mannerisms through which i am saying the word this were not there but it was with time that you included the exclamation mark or the question mark in order to bring in a little bit of the tone through punctuation uh, when when actors have to look at plays they have to figure out exactly how a certain sentence or a certain line has to be uttered because the text itself the text of the play doesn't give them the tone the tone has to be created and very importantly is that writing uh, another characteristic of writing is that writing has to be done solitarily it has to be done alone you uh, mostly maybe you find uh, most people find it very difficult to write a, in a group of people whereas where speech is something that is created in the presence of others it's very difficult to speak uh, without a room full of people i i'm trying to do something that is uh, most teachers are not used to which is to speak to an inanimate camera right now imagining that there are students on the other side of the camera but to have a classroom of people classroom full of uh, students would make communication a lot more easier because that is what we are habituated to all right but but writing in a room full of people with everybody speaking is 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 a far more difficult exercise even in an examination hall silence is maintained you are you are required to write on your own right and this is something that is very difficult for poor families this is also a question of uh, question of um, access right so these are some of the characteristics of early chirographic uh, uh, you know uh, uh, resources uh, just to finish off a few things about the early period i mean the very interesting that uh, there were <laughs> there were times when uh, when uh, writing comes about this is very very interesting to note that when someone puts a document together how do you authenticate that document because you know in previous uh, before writing there would be messengers messengers would travel from one place to another and utter the message of the speaker or the speaker himself or herself would be there but when kings would or rulers would send certain documents in a written form they required some kind of a physical assurance of authority along with it so there would either be a knife or a sword or even a seal or a stamp this is very very interesting as long as things were written by hand you needed a physical immutable form to authenticate that piece of writing but imagine a situation when today's day and age when you type something out you print it out when a typed piece is there it is authenticated not through a seal not through uh, no sword or something of that sort i i, I just uh, wish to uh, remind you of the story in uh, ramayan for example where um, uh, hanuman takes ram's message to sita but how does sita know that it is ram who has sent the message through the ring right so the physical object actually authenticates the message either you know who the messenger is but in this particular case sita had no way to know who hanuman is so therefore hanuman is sort of kind of the written document uh, uh, if if it is, is in a position similar to that of the written document uh, if the sita knew the messenger that would be authenticated right but in this particular case sita didn't know the messenger so it is authenticated through the ring but when a typed uh, piece is there it is printed it doesn't ca carry the manual form of writing it is authenticated through the signature the signature is looked upon that kind of presence of the author all right so there is something that is important for us to know that various kinds of the processes of writing were not always the same as in earlier days and age now you understand that clock time or calendar time is something that is very very uh, recent i mean till about the 13th or 14th century you did not have clock time you did not have clear sense of date year exactly right so you had to refer to epochal period so early charters did not have a clear sense of when they were written time would not have been written there 
all right and you find that you know very early forms of writing would emulate the oral pattern all right so when uh, let's say the iliad or uh, odyssey and other forms of poetry are created they still um, follow the oral poetic process it's only later on that you know forms which are associated more with the written form the almanac or in the case of the print the novel comes into being but even in the novel in the early novels the writers would will use terms like dear reader today i'll tell you about this story you know so it, it is a more conversational tone it is like someone sitting down and tell, telling a story so that oral remnant that vestige of the oral form continues into into the into the written form into the printed form it is only much later by about the 19th century that the dear reader is dropped so uh, once again referring to you that there are certain features of older technologies who continue which continue into uh, the practice in newer technologies where the technology itself may actually demand a different practice all right it is only when the technology comes into being on its own that you uh, the that 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 vestige is dropped and this uh, new practice comes into being all right so this uh, you know I, uh, even in early writing you had uh, when manuscripts are there they are used to speak aloud people look at it as a as as, as, as a kind of tool to memory and then sp speak it aloud it's 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 almost like a teleprompter it's used like a teleprompter it's very important that you must understand that you know there are certain vestiges which which are there from from the oral world into the written world you know this the entire process of auditing of defense so when when you take an interview what you were doing is your it's not the written exam the written exam is followed by an interview when that happens you are falling back into the practices of oral knowledge that is checking out whether you really have the knowledge whether the knowledge is with you whether you can only express yourself in writing or also in the speaking of it that is what uh, the oral defense or the viva really the viva is a vestige of oral forms of disp disputations where scholars would sit across and dispute in the presence of others all right so the interview or the viva is a remnant of the oral practices then those of you who know a little bit of accounting would know that there is a process called audit audit is where you there is a written uh, document which which notes down the accounts but that is audited means it is verified all right now this is again a vestige because audit is oral is because before the coming of writing you did not have process of presenting a uh, written accounts it would be accounts would be you come back you go to the shop you buy whatever you will and say i spent this much on uh, oil this much on uh, uh, vegetables and this and that this is the record so that is how uh, financial accounts was done by uh, oral means and that term has stuck so you realize that there are many things in our 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 practices which 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 uh, were which are vestiges of previous uh, practices of uh, oral world I'll leave you with one last point uh, uh, about uh, manuscripts now the early manuscripts were not easy to read because um, vowels uh, at least in the roman uh, universe uh, you know uh, uh, and in fact in various other languages the development of vowels is something that occurs much later all right so the only way in which one could read a, a manuscript wo uh, 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 in the very early uh, periods of uh, writing would be by reading aloud you could not it, it was very difficult to read if, uh, 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 something without the vowels in place so it is not that in the early the moment writing comes into being people 
stop remembering texts, stop, stop memorizing texts or stop speaking, speak, uh, speaking from memory. Writing only becomes an aid to memory, it, it still remains in the memory, the writing is there as a reference and point number one, point number two, the written manuscript could only be read aloud, could come alive only in its reading and not in its uh, not uh, uh, silent reading was much later developed. All right, so I'll stop there for uh, this essay, and we will take on with uh, 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 in the next lecture. We will uh, look at another essay by Ong, where he discusses the issues of writing a whole lot more. Thank you. <laughs>